today on an all-new Dr. Phil. Her arrest made headlines to keep her boyfriend. She faked a pregnancy. This goes on for nine months, and now you got to produce a baby. Yeah. Staged a fake casting call. I set up an audition. For a Bollywood film. Correct. And abducted a child. You took someone's baby, jumped in a cab, and disappeared into the night. I wasn't going to steal the baby. I was just going to borrow it. What do you mean you were going to borrow? You borrow a cup of sugar. Plus, you don't have any boundaries. I do not have feelings of guilt. I don't have a conscience. It's possible that I could one day kill somebody. Sociopath? I have cut myself. It's one of the hallmarks of being a sociopath. Actually, that's not a hallmark. Or con artist. You're in disguise. Are you working a scam now? Let's do it. Why don't we stop all the drama, stop all the fighting, and let's go get you better. Show, everybody. If I can help get this family back on track, are you willing to do that? Ready, free, take. This is going to be a changing day in your life. Do it, Dr. Phil. When you hear words like sociopath or child kidnapper, what picture comes to mind? I mean, you're thinking like Ted Bundy or Jeffrey Dahmer, right? Yeah. Certainly not people like this. In today's show, you're going to meet two women. Good-looking, well-spoken, but most definitely not what they appear to be. Now, my first guest grew up with dreams of falling in love, getting married, and having children. So how did she end up in jail for two and a half years? Would you believe that this young, aspiring model got so desperate to please her boyfriend that she attempted to kidnap a baby? She actually faked a pregnancy then staged a casting call asking for newborns. And when she found one she liked, she took off with it out the back door. Her story made international news headlines, and today, for the first time, she is speaking out. But before we meet her, let's hear how this all started. Take a look. My boyfriend and I were on an on-again, off-again relationship for three years. I really loved him. It was the first boyfriend I ever had that was a serious relationship. One day his friends were looking through my purse and they found a missed period that I wrote down. His friends told him I was pregnant. I had to pretend I was pregnant because I was afraid to lose him. And, you know, his friends were trying to break us up. I gave up so much of myself and my career and my money to satisfy his happiness. I lost a piece of me. So because I lost all that, I didn't want to lose him. Five months after I told him I was pregnant, we broke up. And that was the most heartbreaking, the most devastating experience. I gave him like thousands of dollars and I lost that money. I lost my friends and I just felt like I had nothing. After he broke up with me in Canada, I moved back to New York and I just really want to hurt him really bad. I decided to continue lying about being pregnant. I figured, well, he would buy things for the baby. In order to convince my boyfriend I was pregnant, I had to make it look real. I got a fake padding and I put it underneath my dress and took the picture and put it on Facebook. While I was in court, they did show the pregnancy picture. I was just trying my best to make it look real because he hurt me, I just want to hurt him. When everything was happening, I was happy, even though it sounds really wrong. I felt that justice was found third. And now I was trying to figure out, okay, what am I gonna do now when the nine months is up? I figured I would just run off and make him think that his kid is with me somewhere around the world and he'll never find me again. But it didn't turn out that way. Okay, now most people would think faking a pregnancy is bad enough, but Michelle didn't stop there. By the night, my, I was feeling very overwhelmed. My boyfriend kept asking me to show him the baby, show him the baby, show him the baby. I was just panicked and I was just under a lot of pressure. I had no choice, I just had to show him a face of a child that looked like him. The plan was that I was going to set up an audition. People would bring in their babies, I would find a baby that looked like my ex, I would take the baby quickly out the back door and I had a cab waiting to take it, show him and then bring it back to the couple. I was never planning to kidnap or adopt the baby for a long period of time. 
A beautiful, aspiring young model accused of kidnapping a newborn baby after cooking up a phony casting call for kids. Police say the New York City native placed ads on Craigslist offering 15 grand for a newborn to appear in a Bollywood film. Several unsuspecting couples took the bait and came in with their babies. Police say Michelle took the baby and then walked out the back door, got into a taxi and sped off. Once I got into the cab, things got really, really bad. I was supposed to be my ex, but he had called the police. Because when I was with my ex-boyfriend, I had a history of running off when I felt panic. He thought I was putting one of my runoff tricks again, and he ended up calling the police. Because he thought that I was running off with his child. When I saw my ex, I handed him the baby. He and the cops just went away. After I gave the police the baby, I was hoping to go back to the audition, find my passport, and say that someone stole my passport. And when I got back to the audition, I was surrounded by police. Then I tried to escape in the cab. The cab driver tried to extort money from me. I had no more money left, and I just had to give myself in. Okay, this was your first abduction, right? My last and only one that ever. You, you had never abducted anybody <laughs> no, before, no. never kidnapped anybody before, never committed a crime before. No. You pulled this caper because you were so invested in this relationship. Correct. And you, you were really in love with this guy. Yeah. His friends didn't like you, did they? No. They were trying to get rid of you? They were trying to break us up. And then they find these notes going through your purse. What are they doing going through your purse? Just trying to be nosy to so get info against me. So they find this note that says you're pregnant, and you say, no, no, I'm not pregnant. But they didn't believe you. No. And so that's when you had the bright idea. I just felt that if I did it, maybe I can... Do have some kind of control and try to... It's his power. Yeah. You want to believe I'm pregnant? I'm pregnant. Yeah. Yeah. So how did it work at first? Um, he wanted me to go for the pregnancy test, and I faked the pregnancy test. All right, and so then you showed it to him? Yeah. Okay, but then, pretty soon, you found an ultrasound from a friend. Correct. And said, here, I'm having a girl. Right. At that point, you're, like, really into it. Well, at that point, you start to believe that you really are having a baby when you're not. Like, you, you become so unhealthy in your mind. So you convinced yourself. Yeah. Did anything go through your mind along the way, like, this is getting really crazy? It got crazy from the get-go. <laughs> like, no, but I mean, at some point, you named this baby, what was your name? Valentina. Valentina. You named this non-existent baby. You had a foam rubber baby. You bought a baby bump, right? Right. And you named it Valentina, and you, you're posting stuff up, pictures. They use this I mean, picture in court, right? Yeah. I just thought that maybe it would make him be more realistic to believe that I was telling the truth. Well, you want him to be more yeah. realistic. You're like mayor of fantasy land, but you want him to be more realistic. We need to snap him, too. <laughs> And you're registered at Babies or Us, yeah. and you thought he would start buying you stuff. Yeah, well, he owed me money, and I just wanted the money back when we broke up. But he wouldn't give me the money back. So I figured, well, if maybe if I lie to him and he bought stuff for the baby, I would get my money back. That's all I really wanted at first after we well, You said up. you wanted revenge at first. Yeah. Originally, I pretended to be pregnant to have some kind of control of the relationship over his friends. And then when we broke up, I felt hurt, and I just wanted to hurt him. And then as the relationship went on when he thought I was still pregnant. He started to change and I felt guilty and I just wanted to tell him the truth, but I didn't know how to because I was afraid of losing him like I did when we first broke up. But how many times had you broken up? Maybe 10. 10 times? Why was 11 any different? I mean, 10 times, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, nine, 10, and the 11th time you say, okay, now I'm pregnant? And you said the gifts from him, you wanted to take back, get the money to finance your singing career? Right. That's a business model. I mean, seriously, you're going to finance a singing career by taking back diaper holders? I mean, did you really think that through? No, I wasn't. I was really unhealthy at that point. Things got really bad between us, and I just, I just kind of lost it. So this goes on for nine months, right. and now it's time to have the baby. you got to produce a baby. Yeah. And that's when you decided to have this casting call, right? Correct. Did you actually think what it was going to be like for somebody to hand your baby and you run out the back door with it? Well, I thought you, you had a cab waiting, right? 
Yeah. So you posted a, a Craigslist ad for an Indian baby. Baby girl, yeah. Because it was for a Bollywood film. Correct. But I wasn't going to steal the baby. I was just going to show him the baby to borrow it. What do you mean you were going to borrow? You borrow a cup of sugar. I know. I know, but this is what was going through my head because I wasn't thinking clearly. Michelle says that she had her reasons for doing what she did, and she didn't think she would be punished with so much jail time. So we're going to talk about that next. And later, we're going to go inside the mind of another woman who is a very proud sociopath. We'll talk about that later in the show. We'll be right back. Most people wouldn't think that sociopaths would look like me. Typically, I don't feel bloodlust, but sometimes I do. And I just have one purpose, which is to destroy this other person. It's possible that I could one day kill somebody. I don't think it's going to happen, but it's possible. Tomorrow on an all-new Dr. Phil. She went from star athlete. What have you been arrested for? Prostitution. To call girl. Did you perform in a homemade sex tape? These things are in the past. It's over. Is she irresponsible? My sister is an unfit mother. Or is her sister? She's evil. Like, that is evil. Plotting against her. I want Quincy to be with her. You think that's insincere? I don't trust her at all. Then on Friday, she says, marry my ex and you'll be sorry. She wanted to warn me about 10. I'm wondering if part of you doesn't want him being with someone else. That's Friday. Once my story hit the news, I it was devastated. A beautiful, aspiring young model accused of kidnapping a newborn baby after cooking up a phony casting call for kids. I couldn't face myself. Like, I didn't know how I was going to turn things back around. Everything I worked for my entire life was done out the drain. No, people were talking about, like, oh, well, she's only famous because of this. But that's not what I'm, I want to be famous for. I was famous before for my modeling. So why throw it in my face because of my crime? Well, Michelle made headlines when she faked a pregnancy, staged a fake casting call, and then actually abducted a child, she says is borrowed, to pretend like it was her own. She served two and a half years uh, in prison. And she says she wasn't expecting such a severe punishment, especially since she surrendered and turned herself over to police. Take a look. Honestly, if I wanted to keep that baby for myself and not give that baby back, I could have gotten away with it. I could have not gave the baby back and just ran off. When they arrested me and I turned myself in, I said to my lawyer, I said, well, how come me turning myself in doesn't count or me, like, bringing the baby back? None of that matters. They're just concerned that I abducted a child. I think it's outrageous because it was a nonviolent crime and I also returned and turned myself in. So why would someone give me 10 years for turning myself in and returning it? Like, yeah, the act was done, but 10 years is a little too pricey. Like, I wasn't thinking about the stranger's feelings. I was thinking about my own feelings. So, yeah, I'm wrong there. But compared to everything else that goes on in the world, no, I don't think it's the worst thing. You're not being real with yourself about this yet. And somebody needs to tell you the truth about this. Because you are an intelligent, attractive young woman with your whole life ahead of you. But you've got to grow up and wake up. I made a list out of all of the things that you've said to us. We recorded a lot of interview with you, right? Right. And I found a set of statements that I thought were particularly revealing. Okay. Number one, you said, I had to pretend I was pregnant. And I had no I choice. Felt that, I felt that way at the okay, time. Now that's not what you said then. That's what you said now in a contemporaneous interview with us now. As you were explaining what was going on, you said, I had to pretend I was pregnant. You're explaining now. Here's why I did. I had no choice. I needed power. I had none. I, I didn't, I'm not taking this out of context. I, I have the entire context, and I can pretty much quote this entire interview to you verbatim. Test me. Okay. Okay. You're telling yourself that now today. That's not true. No, I don't believe that today. I meant I felt that way at the time. I, I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. Next, you said, compared to everything else in the world, no, I don't think it's the worst thing. You took someone's baby 
and ran out the back door, jumped in a cab, and disappeared into the night at 11 p.m. Do you have any idea the trauma that that creates to a young couple? And I learned that the hard way from going through jail, but compared to a lot of crimes, I do agree, yes, it's not the worst crime, but it's a horrible crime. You cannot trivialize that. You're trying to say, hey, and, and, but let me finish. You said, I was the victim of a man. But it's, not, it's not an excuse. I, I don't need to victimize myself. That's what you said. But that's how I felt at the time. That's how I felt. You said, we broke up. I wanted revenge. It seemed natural. At the time, yeah. That, but that's not natural. You get that now? But I'm trying to explain to you what I was thinking and going through at the time. You said, because no one would believe me I wasn't pregnant. I decided to use this to my advantage. And I did. And but it wasn't to your advantage. Do you get that that wasn't to your advantage? No, it made, me, it made things worse. It made the situation worse. It made it worse. real worse. I thought if I continued to lie, then my ex would buy me baby stuff and I could get money for it. I needed money for my music career. You realize how devastatingly self-destructive that was. Yeah, and I was very self-destructive at the time. And I, I realize how deluded you were because you also said I actually started to convince myself I was pregnant. And I did. This was all at the time when I was emotionally unstable. You said I did feel some justice. I had to find a way to get a baby. Again, you said I had to find a way. No, you didn't. You just had to say, hey, I lied to you. You're a jerk. We don't belong together. Bye. And that's what healthy people do, but I wasn't healthy-minded. But you would say that now. Yeah. Yeah. You said, and you said this now, you didn't say this at the time, you said this now. Those families shouldn't have let me take their children into another room that late at night. I thought that was crazy. I gave the baby back and turned myself in. Does none of that count? I think the parents should have been charged. No, I didn't say I think the parents should have been charged. Yes, you did say you think the parents have been charged. You sure it was a misunderstanding? <laughs> no, 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 seriously, you guys are asking me questions. And I was trying to answer according to the questions they were asking me. But I was, every time I would tell my point of view first, then they asked me the question and then, then I would try to answer. I just feel that maybe you might be trying to change my words a little bit around. Why would we do that? Well, I'm on a talk show and you want ratings? I don't know. <laughs> Wow. Well, I hate to burst your bubble, but I don't need you for ratings, girl. And if I was going to do something to get you for ratings, changing your answers to say, I think they should have been charged, how does that it changed the but I was story. trying to explain to them this is what people told me. This is not how I felt. I'm just saying people have come to me and say they thought they should have been charged. So you did say it. But you I were just said saying it, what... but, but not about my feelings. I'm talking about what someone else has told okay. me. And you, you were saying they're just concerned that I abducted a child. Ten years is a little too pricey. Well, I don't... Did thing... you say that? No, I did say that. I, I do think 10 years is too, way too long. Obviously, I, didn't need, I think it was more about getting treat, treatment. Yeah, you said I only planned to borrow the baby. That was what was in my head at the time, yes. Yeah, but that's... But Obviously, I did adopt a child. I adopted a child. I owned up to it. I took responsibility, and I went... And you didn't serve 10 years. No. You served two and a half. Correct. You said I only kept the baby for a short time and turned myself in, and the judge still gave me three years. But you didn't turn yourself in out of conscience, you turned yourself in because you ran out of options. Right? You it ran was out of money, too. you dropped your passport, you were overwhelmed, so you just gave up. If I really wanted to hurt that child or if I wanted to keep the child, I would have never turned around and gave the baby to the police. You understand that to a mother and a father, and I understand. this would be devastating. And it's very devastating, but I was thinking like a kid, I wasn't thinking of a parent. I've never been a parent, so I didn't know... But now, after doing this, you realize the gravity that this I had. do, I really do. Now, coming up, Michelle says she didn't really hurt anyone by kidnapping this baby. She certainly didn't hurt the baby, that's true. But her family feels different. And they sent me a message that they want her to hear. 
This is part of the fallout from this that she needs to own as an adult. We'll talk about that and hear what she has to say when we come back. Monday on Dr. Phil. You went missing for 11 years. The exclusive interview with runaway mom Brenda Heist. You go from being a mom in suburbia at 11 that morning to hitchhiking to Florida. What really happened while she was gone? You had a relationship for seven years. Were you in love? The hard questions. You looked healthy and happy. Did you know they declared you dead? That they suspected your husband of foul play? And surprising answers. How could you not call your children for 11 years? Her tearful plea to the kids she left behind. <laughs> then, say hello. The surprise reunion, Monday. I can't believe you're here. When I think back about my crime for abducting a baby, I feel like it was a crime of passion. Because I was thinking with my heart, I wasn't thinking of anything doing it to hurt anybody in a physical or emotional way. I was thinking about trying to protect someone I cared about and keep them from being hurt. I never thought I would get arrested or be sent to jail. You have family in the U.S. and family in Canada, right? Correct. We reached out to Michelle's family to see what they had to say. Now, one of her family members responded with a letter. Um, now, she asked to remain anonymous. Um, the letter that she sent, um, and I will give you the letter okay. so you can read it after the show. Uh, it is extensive. It is multi-page with a lot of detail, and I think it will help you to read it. Um, I pulled some excerpts from it because I think you need to know how they feel about this. Because you've been upset that, that they have basically cut you off. Correct, yep. And how do you feel about I was, that? I was heartbreaking because they've always been... Families should be there for each other. Here are some excerpts from the letter. Family members, including myself, bought her baby clothes along with other items she would soon need. Michelle continued to fake her pregnancy while in Canada. She stayed at her aunt's house where she continued to premeditate her plan in secrecy. As a relative, my family and I here in Canada are appalled at her disgusting behavior. Dr. Phil, Michelle doesn't quite understand the damage she has caused. She not only has a criminal record, but she has brought shame and disgust to our family. Michelle should still be locked up for what she did. She stole someone's child and she put that child at risk of harm. I strongly believe that she should be seeking some serious help under strict confinement in a jail cell. Coming from a relative of Michelle's, I don't want to fix my relationship with her. She does not deserve my friendship, support, or loyalty. I believe she should still pay for her mistakes instead of her parents being so naive to her actions. They not only let her believe it's okay, but allow her to get away with it. I feel it is very important for her to hear exactly how she has affected our family. Thank you. So that, I think, is representative of how they feel. I, I'm not going to let that get to me because I feel that, you know, why judge someone for their actions? In the end of the day, God has to judge you. And I had, that was the biggest lesson I had to learn. This is behind you at this point. You're on parole in Canada. In, in Canada, yes. Okay. You can start over here. You said, how do I keep people from judging me? People need to know you get it. That what you did was selfish, it was immature, it was narcissistic. People need to know that you get that, that there's no excuse for it, there's no justification for it. That you, you can't trivialize it, categorize it. It was wrong, wrong, wrong. You can't be trying to spin this, position this, you just have to own it. It was wrong, it was devastating to those people, they did nothing to deserve that, and you have to, you just have to own that and, and then move forward. And if you want people to let this go, they need to know that you get it. That's what allows people to move on when they realize she gets it. I get what you do saying. you get it? I do get it, but I still feel that even if I got it, there are people out there that are still going to judge me, and that's my fear. That may be 
for the rest of your life, but you can't give your power to those people. If you know I did something wrong and I acknowledge that and I own it and I get it and I forgive myself and I'm starting fresh, I have matured and I'm moving on, then that's all you can do. You're right. That's all you can do. You're right. And, and it, you'd be at peace with yourself about it. You can't make sense out of nonsense. It was a crazy thing to do. It, it was an immature thing to do. It was very crazy. It's too crazy. All right. I'm nice glad to meet you. Here. Thank you. All right. Coming up, my next guest says she's a sociopath, and everybody knows a sociopath in their life, whether they realize it or not. We'll be right back. One of my favorite pastimes is ruining people. When I think of ruining somebody, I can't help to salivate the way that you might when you're thinking of a juicy steak. Well, everyone in the audience, take a look around. There are roughly 300 of you here. What if I told you that there is a chance at least three of you, but as many as 12 of you are sociopaths? It's surprising, but true. My next guest believes that she is a sociopath, and she has many of the traits to prove it. Take a look. When most people think of a sociopath, they think of Hitler, they think of a serial killer, they think of the embodiment of evil. Most people wouldn't think that sociopaths would look like me. I have been diagnosed as a sociopath. I don't feel guilt, I don't have a conscience that can be very charming, superficially so. I have very shallow emotions. I have carefully crafted my persona over the years. And even now, most people believe that I'm from a foreign country because I speak with a slight accent. This language that I've perfected is both different enough but familiar enough that it's intriguing but comforting. Even though I'm a sociopath, I do have a moral code. I'm an active practicing Mormon. I actually have a pretty normal upbringing, stable middle class home, and I have what most people would consider success. I've made well into the six figures. I've had high powered attorney jobs. I've been envied by many, and now I'm a law professor. I see almost every personal interaction I have as a game to further effectuate my goals, to get ahead, to have more power. One of my favorite pastimes is ruining people. I mean that I'm able to get into their head in such a way that I become sort of a puppeteer. I do something and they react in a particular way. It's very satisfying. When I think of ruining somebody, I can't help to salivate the way that you might when you're thinking of a juicy steak. In some ways, I think my enjoyment of ruining people is the best reflection of my sociopathy. It is probably my most malicious personality trait. Well, Emmy recently wrote a new book called Confessions of a Sociopath, A Life Spent Hiding in Plain Sight, and says that although she's ready to educate the world on why sociopaths aren't always bad people, she's not quite ready to reveal her true identity. Uh, so as a result, we're not using her real name, and this is not how she looks uh, every day. So tell me why you wrote the book. Well, I wrote the book as kind of a continuation of a blog that I had been writing. In 2008, I started writing a blog, Sociopath World, uh -huh. and it was after I had experienced some difficulties <clears throat> in my life. I had relationships and I had been fired from a prestigious, well-paying job, and I thought, you know, I recognize a pattern here. Every three, two to three years or so, I basically do enough bad <clears throat> things that my life uh, ends up in shambles and I am young and this, this probably cannot continue for the rest of my life. So who diagnosed you as a sociopath? So I met with a psychologist as part of this uh, period of self-exploration and started thinking you know somebody had mentioned previously that I was a sociopath and so I thought well maybe I am a sociopath and if I am a sociopath I, I would like to confirm it for sure and I would like to know what exactly it is what I'm dealing with who who am I everything you're describing is very inconsistent with sociopathy everything I'm talking about self-introspection uh -huh. mm -hmm. you're, you're talking about insight and 
self-discovery and things that are just not consistent with antisocial personality or sociopathy at all. Are, are you speaking right now with this, um, this cultured um, accent that you say that you, that you have? Uh, I think so. I myself Cause I don't, don't, I don't hear, hear an accent. I don't hear it either. You say you've worked on it to the point that it's familiar and intriguing. Do you think it's familiar yet intriguing? I don't hear it at all. A lot of people don't hear it at all. So maybe that's its, maybe that's its secret power. It could be. <laughs> you say that you shape your self-presentation. If you're kind of a shape shifter, what am, what am I dealing with now? Is this, right. is this you? Is this a whole scam? It's a, it's a very good question. When I say that Thank I... <laughs> when I say that I adapt to every situation, mainly I mean there's not really a default uh, sort of shell. What am I dealing with today? Like, for example, you're in disguise today. Right. Are, are people that know you going to recognize you? I don't know. Are you working a scam now, or are we having a genuine conversation? Well, so I don't I, know. I wouldn't say that I work a scam every minute of the day. You say ruining people, you love the way that phrase rolls around your mouth. Right. I you like to imagine phrase. I've ruined people or seduced someone to the point of being irreparably mine. Right. I comment on the desire to exploit my admirers or kill babies and cute animals and don't even need to laugh or smile for people to think I'm joking. Uh, I'm continually shaping my self-presentation so I can control what people think of me. You say continually, so I'm just wondering if you're doing that now. Yeah, yes, I am um, doing it now, but I don't think it's I don't think it's quite to the extent that people think. Well, and this is exactly I'm why I'm here, is to hopefully demystify sociopaths a little bit yeah. and to they're not challenge very, some of the myths. They're not very mystic to me. They're just, they're not. no, they're just users and abusers. Do you know sociopaths uh, then? Oh my, yes. Um, <laughs> they're, they're more common than people think. Uh, let's take a break. I think at one time or another, a lot of us have wanted to kill someone or wished ill will. But when M.E. has those thoughts, does she ever think about actually doing it? She talks about this in her book, and I'll let you hear what she has to say about it when we come back. Typically, I don't feel bloodlust, but sometimes I do. It's just like a, a switch has flipped, and I just have one purpose, which is to destroy this other person. I never use knives. I have learned to make recipes without using knives because I'm not able to force myself to be careful enough with a knife. If it starts getting close to my fingers, I just close my eyes because I think it's likely I'm about to cut myself, but I would rather not watch myself do it. Every time I hurt myself, there's a little bit of a thrill that I could do this to myself, and also I survived doing this to myself. Um, like sociopaths portrayed in the movies, Emmy admits that she's had real thoughts and dreams of killing people. One of my first recurring dreams was a dream about killing my father with my bare hands. At the time, I must have been eight or nine, and in the dream, I knew that he was going to kill me. And so I was planning on running away, and I would try to gather as much as I could so that I would be able to survive on my own. And one of the things I remember trying to gather was a knife. I actually enjoyed having the dream because I felt that every time I had the dream, I got quicker, I got better at collecting the things until finally I did succeed in killing my father and running away. After I woke up from the dream, finally having successfully killed my father, I felt a sense of calm and power, that I also had control in this relationship. Typically, I don't feel bloodless, but sometimes I do. I get angry to the point where it's just like a, a switch has flipped, and everything gets very calm in my mind, and I just have one purpose, which is to somehow destroy this other person. In those moments, I would like nothing more than to take somebody's head and ram it into a sign. It's possible that I could one day kill somebody. I don't think it's going to happen, but it's possible. Wow. 
Let's talk about the knives. Have you, you say you don't trust yourself with knives? Yeah, I'm terrible at knives. I have cut myself, I have scars all over my hands. It's uh, one of the hallmarks of being a sociopath. You, it's difficult to learn from mistakes. Actually, that's not a hallmark of sociopathy. They don't like to hurt themselves at all, so you're quite wrong about that. I'm not doing it on purpose. That's, that's the whole problem. If I could control it, if I could be more careful about knives, I would. Yeah. You, you said one of the reasons that you wanted to maintain some anonymity is there are people that you've ruined or hurt in the past that might, given these confessions that you're making, might go, oh, now that she's made that confession, I might use that against her to um, get some type of retribution legally or otherwise. My primary reason for staying anonymous is that I have a family and little relatives, nieces and nephews that have done nothing to mm -hmm. sort of bring any sort of notoriety to mm -hmm. them, their own selves. So you care about them? I do. I care about them in, in particular ways. I do. I, I feel love for them. How do you square that up with um, your reading about sociopathy? Well, so it's interesting you keep mentioning of these traits that you think are or are not, and there's actually a lot of uncertainty about which traits uh, sociopaths have. Most of the research that's been done has been done with prisoners in prison, <clears throat> mostly for violent crimes. So you can imagine that when studying prisoners who have been accused and convicted of violent crimes that you would see a lot of violence. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know what that means. You, you said I'm a rat and I'll take advantage um, and I can without apology, every advantage I can without apology or excuse. And you say that you, you don't have any boundaries. Um, you don't have an off switch in your brain telling you to stop. I do not have, uh, I do not have feelings of guilt. So yeah. guilt is primarily what people feel and associate with a conscience. So you would say that I don't have a conscience. That doesn't mean that I don't have the ability to make decisions. I obviously make decisions. I made a decision to come here. I make a decision mm -hmm. to stay anonymous, to protect my nieces and nephews. Uh, M.E. says she thinks she wants to have children of her own and would be happy if they were also sociopaths. We'll talk about that when we come back. There is something appealing to me about the idea of raising children. Perhaps it's having little people that I can shape that represent an extension of myself. If I had a child and I realized that he wasn't a sociopath, I think a little part of me would be disappointed. I think that I have trained myself to fear making decisions that have consequences that I can't predict. And killing is one of them. Unfortunately, marriage is also one of them. And so I've had to now train myself to take this risk of marriage in a way that I have tried to train myself not to do with killing. Part of the reason that I want a family, honestly, is because my church says that I should be married and that I should have children. There is something appealing to me about the idea of raising children. Perhaps it's having little people that I can shape that represent an extension of myself. I feel like I would be able to guide a little sociopathic child well and help them be successful and really enjoy life. If I had a child and I realized that he wasn't a sociopath, I think a little part of me would be disappointed. How, how do you think you got this way? You think it came from your family or you think what? So. My research has suggested that it's part genetic, you know, approximately half genetic and half environmental. You said that if people try to guilt induce you about the way you are, that it makes you angry. Well, th there's something sort of offensive about it. It would be like if somebody realized that I was deaf or something and continued to sort of speak and rant at me in a way that I could not understand. You know, I, I don't, I, I wouldn't seek to guilt induce you. Um, I, but I would feel sorry for what you miss in your life. As you say, every three years, you self-destruct. You get three years' experience, ten times over. You never get to the fourth year, the fifth year, the sixth year, the ninth year, the tenth year, the twelfth year. 
I hate that for you. And that's one of the reasons why they say sociopaths do not learn by experience, is because they sort of forget what's happened and they start anew over again. Emmy's friend and co-worker is joining us on the phone. She says she wants to know why Emmy doesn't manipulate her. Uh, hello? Hi. How do you know she doesn't? I don't, uh, really, actually. But I can say that I've never felt the effects in the way that she describes in, in her book that she's done to certain people. Maybe she's not as good at it as she thinks she is. <laughs> Interesting. I don't know. You know, I, I, I've never personally observed the behavior that she talks about. Um, I've, you know, I've heard bits and pieces of it secondhand, and now I've read a, a copy of her book. Um, <clears throat> you know, and it disturbs me. I, I mean, I have to admit that. Um, you know, I, I, she never directed it toward me, but I suppose in some way I always have to be wondering if she could. Well, you know, Emmy, is she right? Have you never turned your guns on her? You know, I, I have sort of, over the years, since 2008 when I started writing the blog, tried to be more conscientious, particularly with my friends and with my family. And so I think that I might have ne never actually manipulated her. That doesn't mean that I don't, in small ways, you know, humor her. What would you like to see from your friend, Emmy, that you don't get? What I want to see for her is what you touched on, Dr. Phil, is that I can, I'm concerned that she's, as a friend, she's never going to have a full life. She's never going to have a real relationship if all she can really operate on is this level of manipulation. And, of course, that's the whole problem from this type of, of adjustment or maladjustment is their perception is that it's working for them, and so their motivation to change is very low because they don't know what they don't know and don't know what they're missing. As a result, they don't tend to change much. I appreciate from hearing from you, though. All right, next, do you know a sociopath? I'll tell you how you might spot one when we come back. Well, thanks to all of my guests today. Uh, Emmy's the author of Confessions of a Sociopath, A Life Spent Hiding in Plain Sight. So look for that. Be sure to log on to drphil.com. I've put a quiz online that you can take to see if someone you may know just might be a sociopath. Thanks for being here. So long. Yeah.